Father, we pray that you would enable us to understand how you inspired these human authors to think about what they saw, what they experienced, what they understood from earlier scripture. And Lord, we pray that you would increase our understanding in this way, that we might know you, that we might walk with you, that we might love what you love and hate what you hate. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to to understand the scriptures that we might proclaim how you have accomplished salvation and that people might see the validity of the claims that we're making from the text itself. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to think well, help us to think clearly, keep us from error, we ask, keep us from being distracted, give us energy and strength, and fill our hearts with joy, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'd like to open this afternoon talking about typology with you by inviting you to look with me at 1 Peter chapter 3, and what I want to do here is look at what I think is a difficult instance of typology. So I want to start with 1 Peter chapter 3, and then go back into the Old Testament, well, along the way, before we go back into the Old Testament, we'll drop in Mark 10 for just a second, and then we'll go back uh, to Exodus chapter 15. And uh, again, look at how Moses uses Moses to set up expectation for what's going to take place in the future. So we begin in 1 Peter 3, and I'm going to start reading in verse 18, where Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, and this is why we're looking at this passage, because Peter says that baptism corresponds to the salvation of Noah and those, those with him on the ark. He says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So Peter is claiming that there is some sense in which baptism corresponds to the flood. Now, before I, I say anything else, I want to I briefly discuss a wrong answer. Okay, a wrong answer to the question of what is Peter thinking or how does this work? A wrong answer, I think, is, well, Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so he can say whatever he wants, which is essentially what some people say. Some people will say, this is what I was taught in my master's program. I was taught the New Testament authors are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so essentially they can override the meaning of the Old Testament. You know, so you've got the meaning of the Old Testament in context, and then you've got these claims about the Old Testament that the New Testament authors make, and they clearly don't align, these people are saying, but it's okay because the New Testament authors were inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you're a thinking person, you're ready to say, wait a minute, it's not okay for the Holy Spirit to contradict himself, okay? If the Holy Spirit inspired the Old Testament, and then he inspires the New Testament author to say something different about what the Old Testament means, he's contradicting himself. We could also add, it's not okay for these apostles taught by the Lord Jesus to claim that the Holy Spirit, who, you know, it's the Spirit of Christ, Peter says that in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, the Spirit of Christ has inspired these Old Testament authors to say one thing, and then Jesus makes these other claims about what those texts, that's not okay. And I would go one step further and say the evangelistic appeal of the church depends upon the validity of the interpretation of the Old Testament found in the New Testament. Here's what I mean. When Peter, the the author of 1 Peter, is preaching on the day of Pentecost, What what is he doing? He's expositing the Old Testament on the day of Pentecost. 
What's he trying to do? He's trying to persuade Jewish people who know the Old Testament to believe that Jesus is the one that the Old Testament was talking about. If those Jewish people conclude that's not what the Old Testament means, Peter, they're not about to believe his message. So the only way that the arguments made by the, the authors of the New Testament have any validity in the, in the ears and in the minds of their audience is if those arguments actually point to what the Old Testament texts actually mean, rightly interpreted, okay? So what I want to argue here is that in order to understand what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 3, we have to understand typology. We have to understand this, this field of thinking that is referred to as typology. And I want to argue that this typology was intended by the Old Testament authors. So uh, I think that Peter is making claims here that are in accordance with, with what the Old Testament authors intended to communicate as they were inspired by the, old, by the Holy Spirit uh, to write their texts. And then I think that Peter and the other New Testament authors have, under the teaching of Jesus, correctly understood the Old Testament. Those claims, again, are necessary for the evangelistic appeal that Christians make to have any traction in, in, in the reason, in the intellect of, the, of their audience. So one wrong answer is to say, well, it, the New Testament says something different from the Old Testament, but it's okay because the New Testament was inspired. That's a wrong answer. Another wrong answer that, that has been trotted out in recent days is the idea that actually the New Testament is calling us to make a leap of faith. This is what uh, a, a writer named Crump has argued that the, the New Testament authors are doing. He, he's arguing that you have to do this Kierkegaard, Kierkegaardian leap into the dark. What he's saying is, it's clear that the Old Testament, mean, Old Testament does not mean what the New Testament claims it does, and you just need to close your eyes and jump and, and make the leap of faith. Those are, in my opinion, those are wrong answers, and I'm going to try to prove to you now how and why those are wrong answers. So where did Peter get the idea that baptism... Uh, corresponds to the flood. Well, look with me at Mark chapter 10. And in Mark chapter 10, uh, the, the sons of Zebedee come to Jesus, starting in verse 35, and they ask to sit at his right, hand, right and left hand in glory. And Jesus says to them in Mark 10, 38, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Now, I'm not going to take the time to go into the cup here, but I, I just want to observe that this is often uh, referenced in the Old Testament. It's the cup of God's wrath. Jesus is speaking of his looming death on the cross where he will drink the whole cup of the unmixed fury of the wrath of God. And then he goes on. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? I'm going to state my thesis, and then I'm going to try to prove my thesis. Here's my thesis. In the Old Testament, uh, the waters of the flood became a symbol of the wrath of God. We talked in the earlier session about how out of the, the master story, you get these images and symbols that are then used to communicate as you continue. So in Genesis 6 through 9, we read of how the, the, the earth was filled with violence. The whole world was corrupt. God decided to, to destroy all flesh. And so he sent the flood as an expression of his wrath. As you then continue across the Old Testament, God's wrath is symbolically described in terms of the waters of a flood. Just one example. Psalm 124. It's a beautiful psalm. The psalmist says here, in Psalm 124, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us. So I think the way that David is operating here is he's thinking in terms of opposing nations, enemy armies, rising up against Israel as an expression of God's disciplinary wrath against the people when they've broken the covenant. So 
but the Lord was on their side. Verse 3, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. So David is talking about enemy armies in terms of the flood sweeping God's people away. And the only thing that keeps that from happening is the Lord being on their side. My point is to illustrate the way that the flood is used as, an, as a symbol or an image of the visitation of God's disciplinary wrath against his covenant-breaking people. Okay, so when Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized in the same way that he's, that he's saying, when I'm crucified, I'm going to drink the cup of God's wrath. He's also saying, when I'm crucified, I am going to be baptized in the floodwaters of God's wrath. I think that's the imagery that stands behind Mark 10. It also informs 1 Peter 3. And now what I want to do is take you back to Exodus 15 and, and try to show that Moses intended the floodwaters to, be, to become this kind of type. Uh, the the floodwaters of, of Noah's flood in Genesis 6 through 9, and then of the waters of the Red Sea. I did not go to 1 Corinthians 10 because I am trying to stay off of uh, my brother's uh, territory that he's going to preach tomorrow night. Uh, but, but we could go there uh, to, to connect the waters of the flood to the waters of the Red Sea to Christian baptism. But what I'm trying to say is I think that these themes stand behind uh, the things that we've seen in 1 Peter 3 and in Mark chapter 10. As we approach Exodus 15, let me just add a couple of guardrail type comments that I, that I hope will alleviate any concern you might feel about this topic of typology. Uh, I think a lot of people are nervous about typology because uh, they feel like people say whatever they want to say. Uh, when, I, when, I was a, when I was in seminary, uh, one of my professors, uh, he was joking, I think, but um, he, was, he was asked in class, um, you know, what, what, what are the guardrails for your preaching? And I think he was joking. He, he looked at us and he said, well, you look at your audience and you see what you can get away with. <laughs> I think he was kidding. <laughs> I think he was kidding. I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to say is we need to demonstrate that the biblical authors actually intended to say these things. Well, how do we, de how do we demonstrate authorial intent. And, and before I go into that answer, let me just say, uh, seeking the intent of the human author, I think, is the simple application of the golden rule to interpretation. So as, as I speak to you, I want you to understand me in accordance with what I intend to communicate. You know, I don't intend you to go out and tell someone that I gave a lecture on physics or molecular biology. No, I intend for you to try to understand what I'm communicating in keeping with what I'm intending to say. And you do too. When you speak, you want people to interpret you in accordance with what you... In, and, and we're just applying that golden rule to anyone that we read, biblical authors included. I further think that it is very easy to justify your, your interpretations by appeal to the divine author. You know, you, you say, well, the text doesn't say this, but the divine author intended to communicate. I think that's very easy to do, and a lot of things can be kind of put up under that umbrella, and at the end of the day, how clever are you? Or, or maybe how dull is your audience, and how much can you get away with? And, and I'm arguing, let's not go that way. Let's try to prove what the human authors intended to communicate. So what are the guardrails for establishing authorial intent? Let me, let me just give you three or four. Number, here's number one. Um, we're trying to establish actual correspondence between real historical events. How, actual correspondence between real historical events. So what I'm saying is I think that Moses saw similarities between the flood and the Red Sea, and then Moses intended to communicate those similarities to his audience. 
These two events actually happened in history. There are, there are uh, more liberal scholars who will see these patterns. They'll see the similarities, but they don't think any of it actually happened. They'll just say, well, this is just the literary contrivance of whoever is responsible for the final form of the text. And, and, and in other words, they just made it up. And, and yeah, they look similar, the flood and the Red Sea, but that's just the result of the ingenuity of the writer. It, it, no, no. I think that God sovereignly ordained that the flood would happen a certain way, that the Red Sea would ha happen a certain way, that David would write in a certain way. God sovereignly ordained all this. And then God so superintended and, and inspired and, and guided the, the human author Moses that he would see the similarities and be careful to include the details that would then lead later writers like Isaiah and David and others to, to also pick up on the similarities and also include the details so that these things would be in place for the New Testament authors to then pick up on later. Okay, so uh, historical correspondence between actual events. How do we know that we're dealing with historical correspondence? Well, we get repetition of keywords and phrases. Repetition of keywords and phrases. Sometimes we get quotation of whole lines. I'm about to start showing you some of these. And then the, the repetition of keywords and phrases and the quotations of whole lines, they, they start adding together to, to show us that there are these patterns, these sequences of events that, that recur across the scriptures. And then when we kind of step back and look at them, we see things like, oh, look, Noah is like, a, he's like a new Adam, and he's like the leader of all the remnant that gets saved. And look, Moses plays the same role, and God makes a covenant with Noah, so he's kind of a covenant mediator, and then God makes a covenant with Israel through Moses. So Moses is like a covenant mediator, and Moses is the leader of the remnant that gets saved. So Moses plays the same role in salvation history that Noah played in salvation history. So there are, there are similarities in significance between these people in terms of either salvation history or their significance in the covenant. All right, let me just quickly run through those uh, features of the text that, that, that we use to validate that we're actually seeing historical correspondence. Repetition of keywords and phrases, quotation of whole lines, um, similarities and sequences of events, and then finally... Um, um, similar status or roles or, or significance in, in covenantal or salvation historical uh, significance in the story. Now, when we start noticing this, as, as these things recur across the Old Testament, we start to sense a growing, building sense of anticipation that is often referred to as escalation. In other words, when you see the flood and then you see these similarities between the flood and the Red Sea, you start thinking to yourself, oh, look, all these parallels between the, the, the flood and the Red Sea or between Noah and Moses. I should probably expect more of this in the future. And then you keep reading and you hit a psalm like Psalm 124 or you read a passage like Isaiah 8 and you, you, you get more contributions into these funds of imagery and so forth and, you, and the escalation builds some more. And then as it builds, eventually it culminates and comes to fulfillment in the New Testament when they start claiming this is what that was about. Okay? So let's look together at Exodus chapter 15 and I want to try to show to you that Moses intended for people to think um, about the flood and also that later biblical authors pick up on what Moses says here and they, they use it to build anticipation for more of the same in the future. Now, as we look at Exodus chapter 15, um, I, I want to try to demonstrate the way that Moses uh, both structures his presentation and... Uh, does everything that I've just talked about, the quotation of phrases, quotation of whole lines, and so forth. So uh, we, let me just briefly remind you of what's happened to this point. Israel was uh, in, in enslaved, and they were oppressed, and God raised up Moses, and he went into Pharaoh, and he said, thus says Yahweh, let my people go. Pharaoh's response is, who is Yahweh? And the Lord, his response to that is, well, I'll show you who I am. And so he visits the ten plagues, 
and uh, culminating in the plague of the firstborn and the Passover, and he brings Israel out, and they get to the Red Sea, and this is where we start getting into application, because this is the way that our lives are going to go. So, so typology is useful for us because we start to expect the way the story went in the Bible is the way the story is going to go in my life. So God, God liberates them from, from Egypt, and he brings them out, and they run right into the Red Sea. And then here comes the army of Pharaoh, and it looks impossible. It looks like there is nowhere to go. And, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I've faced those kinds of situations in pastoral ministry. Uh, we, were, we were at a place in our church at one point where uh, we really wanted to hire our worship pastor as a full-time pastor of our church. And then this other church is trying to hire him. So things are starting to get uh, like urgent, like we really need the funds to hire this brother uh, because we want to keep him. He's doing great ministry. We, we do not want to lose him. And um, so he actually went to California to visit this other church that's trying to poach him from us. You know, we're not very happy about this. And um, so he's away, and while he's away, uh, the elders gathered together, and, and the first thing we did was we prayed. And, and, and what we prayed was, uh, Lord, we think that you brought Matt D'Amico to us, and uh, we think that you have equipped him to do this ministry, and, and we feel like we're the Israelites, that you delivered from Egypt, and now we're out in the wilderness, and we have nothing to eat. And Lord, we need you to give us manna from heaven. We need you to, su to supply us with supernatural provision. We finish the prayer. We kind of look around. There's no man on the ground. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, there isn't money in the room. This was like a Wednesday night. We said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to get together on Sunday after church, and we're going we're to look at our budget, and we're going to slash our budget lines, and we're going to try to come up with, with all the money that we can to, to build a full-time salary for Matt D'Amico. And in the, in the preparation for that meeting, me and another uh, pastor, we actually looked at the budget and we slashed everything that we, we could slash in preparation for the meeting. And we saw that we were still going to be right at $25,000 short. So we're going into the meeting thinking we need $25,000 and we don't have it. Church ends that Sunday. We're going to meet after Sunday during while the rest of the congregation is having a potluck lunch together, which we do weekly. And um, as, I am, as I'm walking to the room, one of my fellow elders says to me, before we go in there, you should probably take a look at this. And he hands me this, this envelope. He's, the envelope's been opened. The document is out of the envelope. I can see that there's legal stationery. You know, it's like a letter from a lawyer. And, um, and I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> a letter from a lawyer? This doesn't look good. And, um, and I, I open the letter and... The letter explains to me that a man who had, this was 2014, a man who had died in 2011, his estate is finally being processed. And in his will, he, he left to the Kenwood Baptist Church of Louisville, Kentucky, located at 6603 South 3rd Street, $25,000. And I, I'm looking at this letter, and, and stapled to the bottom of the letter is a check for $25,000. I've never seen, I mean, in, at that point in my life, I'd never seen a check for that much money. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just looking at this, and I, and I go into the room where the elders are, and I say, brothers, uh, you, <laughs> you, you got to see this. And one of them naturally says, that's manna from heaven right there. This is the way that our lives go. This is, this is the way we should expect our lives to go. On the basis of, this is why I think Paul says in Romans 15, 4, um, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction so that by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Okay, Exodus 15, they, they've just been brought through the waters of the Red Sea. And, and actually, as we approach this, let me draw your attention to um, Exodus 14, verse 21. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And that particular term for dry land is also used in Genesis 7.22 uh, to describe the waters covering all the dry lands. And then right after that, in Exodus chapter 14, uh, verse 28, the waters returned and 
covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them. That particular term for uh, the waters covered the chariots and the horsemen is also used in Genesis chapter 7 verse 20 to describe the waters covering all the high mountains in the, in the description of the flood. And when it says there in verse 28, the waters returned, this phrase is used in Genesis 8, 3, to just after the Lord caused the wind to move upon the waters, the waters you know, re- began to recede. So Moses is using key words and phrases from the flood narrative to describe the waters uh, opening up and making dry land for Israel, and then covering uh, Pharaoh and his chariots and hosts when they returned uh, over Egypt. Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, saying... Now, what, what, what we're about to see is that Exodus 15 is shaped as a chiasm. It, in other words, it's going to start and end at the same place. It's going to work through the same things until it reaches a center point. And the chiastic structure is important for the typological message, and, and as we'll see as I, as I hope to demonstrate. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously there in 15.1. Look over at verse 21. Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Notice how the words in 15.1, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, are repeated. You could say the whole line is quoted. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Same with 15.1. That's 15.21. 15.1, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So that's your first, that's your outer bracket. Uh, 15.1 and 2 is going to be, is going to join 15.20 and 21 as the outer brackets of what we might call the song of the sea or the song of Moses. In verse 2, Now, let me remind you what's just happened. They've just experienced the exodus from Egypt. They've just come through the Red Sea. And now in verse 2, Moses says, The Lord is my strength and my song. Now, what he's saying is, I didn't split those waters. I didn't kill the firstborn of Egypt. The Lord did that. The Lord is my strength. And then when he says, The Lord is my strength and my song, he's saying, I'm not singing my praise. It wasn't my staff. It wasn't my arm. The Lord is the song. Okay? The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Now, uh, I don't really have... Derek went into this some, but, but all through the Pentateuch, I think Moses is saying, uh, you're going to go into the land, you're going to break the covenant, you're going to get exiled. But then, when you seek the Lord... You will find him when you search after him with all your heart, Deuteronomy 4.29, and he's going to bring you back and restore you to the land. And then what starts to get, it, get added in is when he brings you back, he will do an Exodus-style work of salvation that's going to bring you back from exile. And I think this is what Isaiah is saying. Look over, at, if you want to keep a finger in Exodus 15, and Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 12, he has, he has just... In Isaiah 11, talked about the shoot from the stump of Jesse, Isaiah 11.1, 1, and he has celebrated the salvation that God is go- going to accomplish through that future king from David's line. And notice what he says in Isaiah 11.11. 11. He says, in that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains. And I think in Isaiah's thinking, the first time was at the exodus from Egypt. The second time is going to be at the new exodus. And then he goes on to say in 11.15, And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt and will wave his hand over the river. So it's like there's going to be a new parting of the Red Sea and there's going to be a new crossing of the Jordan River. And then in 11.16, There will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. So Isaiah is clearly likening or comparing God's future salvation of his people to the salvation that he, that he accomplished at the Exodus. 12, 1 and 2. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For, the, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. And then listen to these words. This is a direct quotation 
of Exodus 15, 2. Let me read you Exodus 15, 2 again. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Isaiah 12, verse 2, line B. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Why is Isaiah quoting Exodus 15, 2? Because Isaiah is talking about a new exodus. Isaiah is saying, we, we, can, we can expect a new exodus redemption after the exile. Now, I should have said, I didn't say, that, that, you know, there's so much detail here that um, it's, hard to, it's hard to bring it all in. But I should have said, uh, back, when I, back before I started into Exodus 15, actually, that uh, I think that Moses had seen Exodus-style patterns of deliverance, not only in the life of Jacob, as, as Derek alluded to, but also in the life of Abraham. You know, Abraham, in, in Genesis 12, he goes down into Egypt because of a famine. And, and Jacob and his sons are going to go down into Egypt because of a famine. And then Abraham's going to tell the sister fib, and Sarah is going to be taken into a form of captivity. She's going to be put into Pharaoh's household as part of his harem, in the same way that the people of Israel are going to be enslaved. It's so, it's so amazing, I have to read it to you. Uh, Exodus 12, verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. And the plagues liberate Sarah from captivity. And right before the plagues, Exodus 12, 16, for her sake, he, uh, Pharaoh, dealt well with Abram. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys... The wealth of Egypt is transferred to Abraham. It's as though Abraham has plundered Egypt in the same way that the, Egypt, that the Israelites will at the Exodus. And, and then just a chapter or two later in Exodus 15, the Lord says to Abraham in Exodus 15, 7, he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans. That, if that sounds familiar, it's because it's just like Exodus 20, verse 1. When the Lord comes down on Mount Sinai and he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. And so here we're seeing those quotations of whole lines that are establishing the, the, the similar sequences of events and showing us uh, the, the repetitions of things that actually happened and that the biblical authors actually intended to point to these repetitions. Later in Exodus 15, the Lord prophesies to Moses that the, that his descendants will be servants in a land not their own for 400 years, and he's going to bring judgment on that nation, and they're going to come out with great possessions. And, and, and he's talking about the exodus from Egypt. Um, so, so Moses, I think, has seen the exodus or seen a preview of the exodus in the life of Abraham, in the life of Jacob, and now he's recounting the actual historical exodus, and he's, he's going to be doing so in a way that anticipates future installments in this Exodus-style pattern of events, or this Exodus type of, of salvation. So Exodus 15, uh, 2 concludes, This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So notice how verses 1 and 2 are all uh, like, I will praise, I will sing. Uh, look, at the, look at the corresponding side of the bracket in 15, 20, and 21. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam, Miriam sang to them, and then we have the quotation of verse 1 uh, that, that follows there in the rest of verse 21. So the outer brackets are focused on the people's response of praise to the Lord. And this is earlier I said, biblical theology includes responses of praise and thanks. The Bible is teaching us that worship looks back to look forward. Worship looks back at what God has done in the past to look forward in hope and expectation of what God will do in the future. This is, this is what we, if, if you say the words of, of, of 1 Corinthians 11, when you, when you celebrate the Lord's Supper, this is what you're doing when you say... Um, uh, on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in re remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You look back. 
until he comes, you look forward. So, so worship is looking back at what God has done in the past in order to look forward in expectation of what God has done, God has promised to do and will do in the future. This is what they're doing here in Exodus 15. Now the next step, so we got the outer brackets, praising the Lord. The, the next step in are going to be these affirmations about God. And earlier, you know, I said that we derive truths from the narrative. That's what they're doing right here. Look at 15.3, 3 and 4. The Lord, and, and I don't know if they do this in Dutch Bibles, but in English Bibles, they use these uh, small caps, they call them, where you have the capital letter, but it's the same size as a lowercase letter. It's the same thing. So, so that represents the divine name, which you could pronounce Yahweh. There are other ways to, arti- to um, articulate it. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And this is, this is really picking up on the way that um, the, Moses asked the Lord. The people of Israel will say to me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? And then he makes that declaration, I am who I am. And then when Pharaoh asked that question, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? The Lord in the next chapter, Exodus 6, it's as though he says, well, he does say, I am Yahweh. And this is what I'm going to do. And the Egyptians will know that I am am Yahweh. So again, they're looking back at the Lord's declaration of his name and they're celebrating it. Yahweh is his name. Yahweh is a man of war. Verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. Look at the corresponding statement in verses 18 and 19. Yahweh will reign forever and ever. Notice how they they start the same way. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord will reign forever and ever. The truth is derived from the narrative. How do we know the Lord's going to reign forever and forever? Pharaoh couldn't take him down. Egypt couldn't stop him. The Red Sea couldn't keep him from getting his way. He will reign forever and ever. And then, just as verse 4 talks about Pharaoh's hosts and chariots, look at verse 19. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. So that repetition of the way that Pharaoh's chariots and hosts were cast into the sea from verse 4, that repetition of that in verse 19 is is forming, again, this this sort of mirrored, paneled structure. You could think of it like like a picture frame where you have... The, maybe the wood around the outer thing, I'm, I'm not seeing any picture frames in here, but inside the wood of the frame you might have a mat or maybe several layers of a mat that are going to correspond to one another and then in, in the center is the picture which is what your eye is meant to be drawn to. That's what we're working our way toward. Uh, the, the, the next, so we got outer brackets of singing to the Lord, uh, one step in, the second level, Uh, who Yahweh is, these affirmations about Yahweh. And then the third level uh, uh, in is verses 5 through 10 and verses 13 through 17. And these units are interesting because, and here's where the typology comes in, the first unit, verses 5 through 10, is concerned with the exodus from Egypt and and the defeat of Pharaoh at the Red Sea. The corresponding unit, verses 13 through 17, is all about the conquest of the land. And it's like what Moses is doing is he's saying, I'm going to put the conquest across from the Exodus. And further, I'm going to talk about the conquest the way that I talked about the Exodus. Because the way that I saved Israel at the, at the Exodus is the way that I'm going to save Israel at the conquest. So at the Exodus, Israel is overwhelmingly outnumbered and and outmanned, outgunned, outplanned. They, they have no chance against Egypt. Well, they are going into that land which is inhabited by seven nations, greater and mightier and more numerous than themselves. And, and once again, they are outnumbered, overpowered, and they have no chance. And in the same way that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, the book of Joshua is going to tell us God hardened the hearts of the kings of Canaan to make them come against Israel. And in the same way that God worked wonders at the exodus from Egypt, he's going to work wonders at the conquest of the land. So we could say that uh, the conquest is an installation in an exodus-style salvation. Or we could say the conquest is a new exodus. 
And then when you read the book of Joshua, I think Joshua picked up on this. So in the, in the, like in the first two chapters of Joshua, there are something like 18 instances of the verb, that is, of the verb avar in Hebrew, which is used to describe both the Passover and the crossing of the Red Sea, the avar. So they're going to they're gonna cross over the Jordan River, and that's going to be explicitly compared to their crossing of the Red Sea. And, and they're going to, they're, again and again, they're going to be described as crossing over into the land. There, there are all these Exodus themes in, in the early chapters of Joshua, even down to Joshua being explicitly compared with Moses and the Lord saying to Joshua, in the same way that I raised Moses up, I'm, I'm going to raise you up in the eyes of the people. Exodus 15, verses 5 through 10, notice how in verse 5 it says, the floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Look at verse 10. There's going to be a bracketing verse that, that marks off this as a unit. Verse 10, you blew with your wind, which sounds like creation, doesn't it? Um, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It also sounds like the flood, Exodus, or Genesis 8.1. God caused uh, a ruach to move over the waters so that the waters begin to recede. You blew with your wind, Exodus 15.10. The sea covered them. Verse 5, the floods covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Verse 5 again, they went down into the depths like a stone. So the repetitions in verses 5 through 10 are marking that off as a unit. While we're in verse 5, they went down into the depths like a stone. Look at verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 16. Uh, speaking of the kings of Canaan. So this is a comparison of... You know, the defeat of Pharaoh at the Red Sea to the defeat of the kings of Canaan in verse 16. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Verse 5, they went down into the depths like a stone. So Moses is speaking of Pharaoh and his hosts with the same terminology that are used to speak of the kings of Canaan. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Um, I I failed to note a moment ago when we were at verse 2, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation, which gets quoted in Isaiah 12 too. That's also quoted in Psalm 118 in verse 14. Uh, Same same terminology. I think the psalmist, again, is anticipating a new exodus. And then these words in verse 6 are picked up in Psalm 118, Verses 15 and 16. The reason that's interesting is because Psalm 118 is going to depict the king approaching the city in triumph, having cut off all his enemies. And he's going to say, for instance, open to me the gates of righteousness. And and in Psalm 118, it almost sounds like that question from Psalm 24, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? And then the, the call, lift up your heads, you gates, And be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory might come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. It sounds like he's come in Psalm 118. And then the people respond and they say things like, "Uh, this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief of the corner. And then they go on to say, Hosanna, you know, Lord, save us. And then they say, we bless you from the house of God. And, and you, you, you probably recognize that these are things that Jesus is going to say. You know, they say to Jesus, tell these people to keep silent. And he says, uh, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. And you won't see me again until you say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's quoting Psalm 118. And it's like Jesus is saying... What was anticipated at the Red Sea, what was anticipated in Isaiah 12, what was anticipated in Psalm 118, that's what I've come to do. Isaiah 15, I'm sorry, Exodus 15, verse 7. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. And then verse 8 is a fascinating statement. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. I would love to 
push pause on this and go uh, walk through Psalm, one, Psalm 18 with you. In Psalm 18, um, David, he starts out saying, I love the Lord. And he goes on about how the Lord is his rock. And then he starts talking about his distress and how he cried out to the Lord. And then the Lord goes into action on David's behalf. And it sounds like God coming down on Mount Sinai. You know, the, the, the earth shakes. There's lightning and thunder and, and, and thick darkness and so forth. And then David says this uh, in Psalm 18, verse 16. He says, um, I'm sorry, it's verse 15. In, in your text, your, your, your Dutch Bibles, I think, enumerate the superscription. So I think it will be verse 16 for you, Psalm 18. He says, Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Psalm 18, verse 15 in English, 16 in Hebrew, and 16 in Dutch, quotes Exodus 15, verse 8. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. What is David doing? David is saying, God saved me from Saul and from all my enemies in the same way that God saved Israel at the Red Sea. That's what David is doing. And David is using the phrases of Exodus 15 to establish this point. Because David understands there's a pattern of the way that God saved his people in the past. And I'm an installation in that pattern. Because just like Israel was outmanned and outnumbered and, and, and so forth, David was outmanned and outnumbered. And David had no hope against Saul. And just as the Lord delivered Israel, the Lord delivered David. And interestingly, just as Israel was God's son, Exodus 4, 22 and 23, um, Israel is my son, my firstborn son, let my son go. There's a sense in which David, as the king of Israel, is like a new Adam, son of God, representative of the nation of Israel. So there are all these really interesting similarities and parallels and patterns and so forth. Uh, Exodus 15, verse 9 the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And the Lord blew with his wind and the sea covered them and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Look at the corresponding section in verses 13 through 17. So verses 5 through 10 of Exodus 15 is all about the triumph of Yahweh over Pharaoh and over Egypt at the Red Sea. Verses 13 through 17 is all about the conquest of Canaan. And in the same way that verses 5 and 10 correspond to one another with the floods, the floods and the waters covering the enemy and, and them sinking like a stone or like lead in verse 10. Look at verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. That's verse 13. Look at verse 17. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. So verses 13 and 17 are both about the Lord bringing his people into the land to his dwelling place. And this thing about his mountain, you know, Mount Sinai, in a sense, is the mountain of God. But that's really picking up the way that Eden was like a mountain, a mountain sanctuary. And then Mount Zion in the land is going to be a mountain sanctuary. And this is all anticipating the new Jerusalem which comes down from God out of heaven in Revelation 22. Uh, verses 14 through 16 in the middle of this, again, is about the, the conquest of Canaan. I'll just read through this quickly. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized. And now he's going to start naming the Canaanites, pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. Uh, notice this, this reference to the greatness of your arm picks up the way that verses 6 and 7 spoke of the right hand of the Lord and the greatness of his majesty by which he overthrew those who rose against him. Verse 16, because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. There's our Passover word. So they're going to they're gonna pass by these, these inhabitants of Canaan that are still as a stone. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. So beginning and end 
I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Second and second to last, the Lord, uh, verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. Verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Third, deliverance from Egypt, particularly at the flood. Third to last, conquest of Canaan. Central statement of this chiasm, verses 11 and 12. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. So at the center of this chiastic statement is this enjoyment of God and and this awestruck wonder that the Lord would be pleased to set his mercy on us and deliver us. And there is no one like you among the gods, O Lord. That reference to the earth swallowing them probably makes you think of what you know happens in number 16, Korah's rebellion, and the earth's going to open up its mouth and, and swallow them. And I think Moses intends to forge these connections between Egypt and Canaan and those who would rebel against Moses. They're, like, they're not like Israelites. They're like foreign peoples if they rebel against Moses, even if they're Levites from the clan of Korah. So all this to say that I think Moses is intending to communicate to his audience that there are these patterns that we see begin, did I start over here, at the flood, and then there's an installment at the, in the pattern at the Red Sea, and then Isaiah anticipates more of this in Isaiah 12, and in Psalm 118, an anonymous psalm, psalmist, there's no superscription on Psalm 118, we don't know who wrote it, he anticipates more of the same. And then in the New Testament, I think Jesus is looking at all of this, and he has rightly understood the intent of the human authors. And he understands that he is, as John the Baptist heralded him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he is the one who, on the cross, not one of his bones will be broken. Which, you know, that's stated in John 19 when they don't break the legs of Jesus. I don't think John means to claim that Exodus 12, 46 and 47 are prophesying when the Messiah is crucified, they won't break his bones. Rather, I think that John means to claim what was typified at the Exodus is fulfilled in the death of the Lord Jesus. And, and so this statement about what you do with the Passover lamb, you don't break any of its bones. It can be applied to the Lord Jesus because of the broader typological pattern. And so they don't break any of his bones, and, and that took place that the scripture might be fulfilled because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. And Jesus is the one who was baptized in the flood God, floodwaters of God's wrath, which washed over the world at the, at the flood of Noah and washed over the enemies of God's people at, uh, at the Red Sea. And in a way, God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So... As he is baptized in the floodwaters of God's wrath, he stands there bearing our transgressions. He himself, 1 Peter, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And when people place their faith and hope in the Lord Jesus, they are united to Christ by faith. And that union with Christ by faith is depicted in the immersion of a believer in water so that so that they are united with Christ in his death and resurrection, something that is only true of those who believe. And I think that this is why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, a baptism, which corresponds to the flood, now saves you. Not a washing, a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. And how do you get that? Well, you get that by justification by faith. You get that by believing and by trusting what God has done for, you, for us in Christ. So I think that the argument made in the New Testament is correct. I think Peter got it right. I think Peter not only got it right, he rightly represented the teaching of his master, the Lord Jesus, who rightly understood what the psalmists and the prophets had communicated because they in turn had rightly understood what Moses intended to communicate. So... I, I contend that there is a profound unity 
to the message of the scriptures. And that if we can, if we can understand the interpretive perspective of the biblical authors, we will feel this unity and we will be prepared to join in this worship that looks back to look forward, singing, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? It's remarkable. In Revelation chapter 15, John presents uh, these, these dead believers. I just want to read Revelation 15, 1 through 3. John writes, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also, Revelation 15, 2, those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. And he's alluding here to chapter 12, verse 11, which speaks of how those who hold to the, to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, they conquer the beast by not loving their lives even unto death. So they conquered by getting martyred for the faith. Those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying. And, and then, they, then they, they celebrate the mighty acts of God in salvation in, in a kind of reformulated uh, song of praise, but it's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It's the same song because the exodus is fulfilled in the new exodus that is accomplished by the Lord Jesus. Let me close with a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you would so convince us of your great worth that we would be prepared to be included among those who do not love our lives even unto death. And Lord, we pray that, that you would cause us to hear those words that John writes in Revelation 13 about how it will be given to the beast to make war on the saints and to conquer them and to kill them. And and then John says, this is a call for the endurance and the perseverance of the saints. Lord, make us those who endure, who persevere. Make us those who know that though the world sings to Satan's fake Christ, who is like you, those words should only be sung to you because you are the only Savior. You are the only one worthy of our worship. So Lord, we pray that you would Protect us and keep us, convince us, persuade us, cause us to be those who stand, cause us to be those who bless those who persecute us, who bless and do not curse. Those who are prepared to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in every circumstance. Because you are the God who parts the waters. You are the God who gives manna from heaven. You are the God who raises the dead. We love you and worship you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.